the free fermion conformal field theory. Um, and now we're going to put it together. OK. What I'm going to show you today is that a theory of a free boson and a free fermion can be put together to form uh, what we're going to call a superconformal field theory. OK? Mm. So to do that, I, 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 I'm going to do the following. Firstly, firstly, consider the following operator. OK? What I'm going to do is to consider um, uh, I'm going to work on a space, which is a two-dimensional space. So the bosonic coordinates of that space will be z and z bar. And I'm going to add two additional fermionic coordinates to the space, OK, uh, called theta and theta bar. Every action I write down will be an integral d2z, d2 theta of the space. OK, now you could ask, what are these fermionic coordinates? Well, they're nothing. Because you can just do the integral over the um, over the fermions, and you've got back a purely bosonic action. Okay, so all my fields are going to be functions of theta, theta bar, phi, and phi bar, z and z bar. But uh, all physical, whenever I've got a field which is a function of theta and theta bar, I'll Taylor expand it in theta and theta bar. The Taylor expansion will end at finite order because theta squared is zero and theta bar squared is zero. So every field which is a function, this, this, what sometimes called the superfield function of this theta and theta bar, is actually just some collection of a bunch of no normal fields. It's just some notational convenience. Okay? So, in order to start, okay. However, before we start um, uh, looking at a specific theory, um, let's, let's, let's do the following. Why this whole notational convenience is interesting for the following reason. Within this notational setup, one can write down the following operator Q, okay, which is uh, del theta, del by del theta, minus uh, theta del by del z. Okay, so just like del by del z is a generator of translations. This quantity will act on fields in the way that you imagine. So it will act on, if you've got a field, it will act on it by, uh, the change in the field will be this operator acting on that field. Okay. So in particular, if that field, it'll mix up the various Fourier, uh, various Taylor expansion coefficients in the theta expansion, because that's what these things will do. We'll see examples in a minute. And we'll also move these fields. That's what this will do. Okay. So this operator, now we want to study the algebra of this operator. Okay. So what I want to do is to study what Q squared is. I've just got one operator, and there's going to be a corresponding anti-holomorphic operator, which will have nothing to do with this. It's just anti-commute with this. Okay. So what I want to do is study Q squared. So let's, let's study that in detail. OK. Um, see, the term in Q squared that, that has del by del theta, the whole thing squared, is 0. Because del the first, what del by del theta means is remove the theta. Del by del theta squared is remove two thetas. But there were never two thetas to remove, so we got zero. Okay. Uh, similarly, theta squared del by del z squared is zero. For the same reason. Okay. I mean, for, for just for the reason that theta squared is zero. Okay. So this whole thing here is del by del theta of minus theta del by del z minus theta del by del z of del by del theta. This is clear? It's acting on some field. You know, imagine this acting on some f of z and theta. OK. Now, um, I will bring this guy. I can bring this guy to the right here. Except that uh, there is a term where I act this on del by del theta. When I bring this guy to the right, I take it through a theta, so it flips the sign. So that cancels this term. So the only term that's non-cancelled is the term where this del by del theta hits this theta. Okay, so q squared therefore is equal to minus del by del z. the 
minus is a bit odd, but okay. Yeah, he went to the other one. Okay. Now, this del by del z is, LZ, is the generator of uh, just, just like momenta. Right, it's, it's, the, it's the thing that was L0 minus L1. It's, it's uh, sorry, it's L minus 1. It's the, the generator momentum. Yes? Why is gamma prefix theta bar and z? What? Theta bar and z. Why it cannot be mixed? Okay, we, we're, we're trying to define a quantity that's purely, purely holomorphic, and there'll be another quantity that's purely anti holomorphic. Okay, so. Uh, but you know, just in Cartesian coordinates, del by del z is just translation in some direction. Okay. Similarly, when we do the same, the corresponding definitions uh, with the q bars. So q bar is equal to del by del theta bar minus theta bar del by del z bar. We find that q bar squared is equal to minus del by del z bar. Okay. So we've got two operators, and of course we have that uh, q q bar anticommutator is equal to zero. So we've got two operators that square two translations on the plane. Okay, uh, using these these two quantities, you can make any translation on the plane you want because every translation is some linear combination of del by del z and del by del z bar. Okay. So these operators are somehow the square roots of translations because they square to translations. Okay, these op the, the the operators uh, generate what we're going to call a supersymmetry. Okay, uh, these are fermionic operators. Their action mixes bosons and fermions, as you will see in a mo in a moment, and they square to translations. Now, what we are going to try to do is to write down Lagrangians that are invariant under this transformation. Invariant under the transformation. Have, have the transformation generated by Q and Q bar as symmetries of the Lagrangian. Just like if you want to write down a rotationally invariant Lagrangian, you would uh, write down Lagrangian that's annihilated by the generators of rotations. Okay? With this vector field representation for Q and Q bar, uh, you can never get a central term. Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you wanted a central term, you'd need some more bells and whistles in your superspace. If you wanted something like that. You'd need to have something which acted on some internal indices. You see, the central term is usually, re is usually related to some other symmetry. For instance, it could be a charge under U1 or something like that. The superspace would have to know about it. That's correct. So if you wanted to represent the supersymmetry algebra with, with the central term, you would need something more than this, this superspace realization. Now, the, um, uh, in superconformal field theories, the kind we are studying, you never have central terms. They well, because they set a scale. So that's not of concern for us at the moment. But you're right that superspace representations will become more complicated if you want to allow for central terms. Can you do it in vector field? This is a vector field. No, I think you will be able to do it. But you'll need vector fields in including some auxiliary space. Yes. And some space that knows about the symmetry which uh, under which you will get the central term. Roughly speaking. What's a vector field? What? What's a vector field? No, a vector field is just this. It looks more like a pseudo vector field, right? It looks like an R cross Q, right? Because it's the one in the Z direction. By vector field, he just means del by del anything. Yeah, but, oh. F mu times del by del anything. Right. For him is a vector field, right? In, in just in infinitesimal in arrows yeah. all that space, yeah. Small, small arrows, the commutator of two small arrows is the vector field. Correct. This is the anti-commutator. Hmm? Now, if, if you have a commutator that is a this is why I made the comment that if you have two vector fields, the commutator term is a vector field. Yes. But if you have a central term, mm -hmm. it does not have any derivative. Mm -hmm. So in a commutator structure, that cannot naturally arise, but this is anti commutator, might be. Mm, I don't I don't think you will uh, you mean you, you want to get a constant, right? 
no, you know, because always you will have some derivative or the other. The derivatives commute with each other. The no lack of commutation will be when it hits some coordinate. You will always have a derivative left over. So I don't think you will be able to get your, your, your structure without some further. This is why, you know, when uh, people, for supersymmetries which larger and larger amounts of supersymmetry, the superspace becomes more and more complicated. There's all kinds of ad additional coordinates. Okay? But we are looking at very simple case. Sir. Okay? Excellent. Now, our task is to try to find a Lagrangian, uh, to try to build Lagrangians that are supersymmetric. That is, I'm invariant under the small generators. I'm invariant under the, uh, the changes in... Uh, uh, fields generated by the, by the action of the, uh, of this Q and Q bar. Now, in order to do that, it's going to be very useful to have a derivative that anti-commutes with Q. And it's very easy to find one. Consider the, quant the quantity d theta, defined by del by del theta plus theta del by del z. Okay, just repeating the algebra we've done here, you, it's basically the same thing, so this minus sign won't be there. You easily convince yourself that del theta squared is del by del z. Similarly, del theta bar squared. But let's now compute anti-commutator of del theta with q theta. Okay, once again, the only terms that we're interested in, um, once again, the only terms we're interested in are the terms um, in which we have one of these and one of these. Okay, so what, we, what are we going to get? So because we start with del theta, we'll have one term which is del by del theta and heading the minus theta del by del z. Okay. But the second term will be plus theta del by del z plus theta del by del z. Uh, there are two sorts of terms, isn't it? And, uh, one from d theta hitting one from q. And, and four terms in total, let's say. Four terms in total, let's say. So one from d, d, this guy yeah. hitting this guy. Yes. This guy hitting this guy gives zero. Right. Okay. So we can have no, this guy. In the anti commutator. Because, because, because it's an anti commutator. Because you have an anti commutator. Exactly. Just exactly. Just yeah. Right. Right. I, I'm just going to write them all down. Uh, yeah. You're absolutely right. So let me write down the terms which were this way and then the terms that yeah. were that way. Okay. So this was del by del theta, which is d, uh, absolutely right. So uh, one term was this, and the second term was plus theta del by del z into minus del by del theta. No, into del by del theta. Then there were the terms where you take this guy on the left. So the terms where you take this guy on the left continue. There's a term which is del by del theta into plus theta del by del z. Hmm? In fact, it's sort of obvious. In but anyway, let's, let's just write it down. It cancels. It cancels, yeah. Okay, and the second term is um, minus, so theta, uh, del minus theta del by del z del by del theta. Okay, and this cancels this, this cancels this, so we just get zero. Okay, so this derivative here has the property that it anti commutes with this, the action of, of Q. So, this tells you that um, this derivative might be useful in building supersymmetric actions. Because the, how, if, if a field transforms in a certain way, how d theta of that field transforms is then sort of clear because you just move q through the d theta. Okay? Now I'm going to try to use this to construct an example of a supersymmetric action for you. Okay? 
So to start with, I'm going to start with a super field. My super field I'm going to call X, and it's just a general real super field. By which I mean that when I expand it out, it's, it's X plus, I'll just check his conventions. plus i theta psi So consider just some general scalar superfield like this. Uh, all I've done is take the most general field. Uh, it happens to be all these fields will be uh, real, but that's not even important here. So just, I've just Taylor expanded them. You can have a term which is theta, a term which is theta bar, and a term which is theta theta bar. That's the most general thing you can have in the Taylor expansion because theta squares to zero and theta bar squares to zero. Okay. Now I want to I want to build uh, a supersymmetric action using this superfield. Okay, now consider the action d two z d two theta del theta x del theta x. This I'm claiming is supersymmetric. Why is that the case? To start with. Before showing that this is supersymmetric, let's start with something simpler. Suppose I have, suppose I've got some superfield. Okay, so the, of course, in order to say that it's supersymmetric, I have to tell you how x transforms and it's supersymmetric. And so delta of x is equal to q on x, where q is the supersymmetric transformation. This is how it, how x transforms. With this rule, I'm claiming that this action is supersymmetric. Okay. Now, uh, why is this the case? This is very simple. See, first, suppose we have any object that which transforms under supersymmetry like this. Let's call such an object a superfield. Okay. Now, first claim is that integral d two z d two theta times a, where a is a super uh, is some superfield, is a supersymmetric action. If you've got A, which is any superfield, which transforms under supersymmetry like this, this is a supersymmetric action. Why is this the case? Well, we just have to check that the transformation of this action under supersymmetry is zero. Okay? But the transformation is integral uh, d by d theta minus theta d by dz of A. Okay? And we've got a total integral. And we've got an integral over a total derivative. More specifically, this term is zero because integration is the same as differentiation in superspace. So this acting on this gives you zero. And this is zero because it's integrated over d by dz. It's a total derivative in space. Top to boundary terms, which we're not worrying about at the moment. This, ob this, this action is supersymmetric. Yes. So when, when we integrate it, only the f term survives, right? That's correct. So That's correct. But you know, then we have to work out how that f term transforms under supersymmetry, which we will do in a, in a moment. But under supersymmetry, the only term uh, I cannot, right? So if you, if you attack q on that term, yes. d by d theta, well, it can kill it because now you're only left with the theta bar. And the d by dz carries the theta, so that also kills it, so you're left with zero. No, no. What, what? If you integrate this, you get, as you said, f. So suppose we started. Right, suppose so if you integrate it, you get f, and if you and if you try acting the q on it, yes, you, it integrates to zero. It integrates to zero. That's correct. But uh, that's correct. So that's the component version of the argument I just made. Uh, so we can try to make your argument. Uh, your question is: You could ask if I have a field like this, and it transforms like this. How do all the components transform? No, you see, yeah, yeah, but but you're gonna, we're going to take products of fields, right? 
So it's true that in the final superfield, right. only the theta theta bar component contributes. But we're going to do manipulations involving products, so many things will contribute. Where as you see, every as you will see, everything will involve x and psi. F, in fact, in this action will be an auxiliary superfield, which will be trivial. Okay. Okay. But is the argument that d two z z times d two theta of an arbitrary superfield that this gives you something supersymmetric? Is this clear? Okay. We can actually work out the argument in the way that uh, Yankee wanted. Um, Let's do that because it's useful just to understand anyway. So let's take this expression and turn it into supersymmetry transformation rule for each of the components of this field. Okay? So delta x, so delta of which is delta x plus i theta delta psi plus i theta bar delta psi bar plus theta theta bar delta f is to be identified with Q acting on this X. Okay, now Q is made up of two things, that's D by D theta. So we will get I psi from this term, nothing from here, nothing from here, and plus theta by F from that term. So this gives what, what we get by, by acting with D by D theta. Okay, uh, and then we've also got minus theta times d by dz. So this term and this term will not contribute because theta will square to zero. But here we will get minus theta del zx. And here we will get minus uh, i theta theta bar del zf, del z psi bar. Okay. And now comparing these two terms, we see that delta x is equal to i psi, delta psi is equal to uh, i del zx. Did I get the i right? Uh, i i minus, good. Uh, delta psi bar is equal to, uh, the, is equal to f with a minus i. And delta F is equal to minus I del Z psi bar. This is the transformation of fields under the Q supersymmetry. You could easily work out an analogous transformation of fields under the Q bar supersymmetry. Basically, the role of psi and psi bar would be flipped in, in this transformation rule. Okay? And now, the fact that integral of such a superfield is supersymmetric, it's simply the fact that the transfer, as Yankee pointed out, the answer to the an action was just f. The change in f is del z of something, and that integrates to zero. Okay? So we. It's because you take an arbitrary derivative, let's say a d by d theta of a superfield, mm -hmm. that does not transform under supersymmetry like a super, like a superfield does. Right. So, you know, we're, in, we're going to be interested, if we weren't interested in kinetic terms, we wouldn't have to worry. But we're going to be interested in putting kinetic terms in action. So we have to put kinetic terms so that once we put the kinetic terms, the, the superfields remain superfields. Okay? Now, the other thing is that if you've got a, a superfield A and a superfield B, then the product of the two is also a superfield. Yeah. This is just because of the Leibniz rule. Right? The whole thing, you have Q on AB, it behaves like it should under each of A and B, transforming separately. Okay? So once you've got superfield, you've got a superfield, you multiply two superfields, it remains a superfield. Okay, so one way of writing down an action is to build superfields and then multiply them. So as I, as we just said, if we were not interested in looking at derivatives, no problem. We could take like any function of x, but that gives you pretty boring physics. We want derivatives, 
and we want derivatives that will give us conformal field, uh, conformal behavior for the particular concerns of the current class. Now, look, let's do some dimension counting. D2Z is two units of position. What is the dimension of theta? Well, you can see from here that theta has dimension of position square root. Because 1 by square, you know, this 1 by square root of position is equal to square root of position times 1 by position. Okay? So, theta is something that has dimension position. So, uh, sorry, square root position. So, you might think that d2 is that d2 theta is dimension 3 in units of length. But that's not true. Is this okay? That's not true because integration of anti-commuting variables is actually formal symbol. It's actually differentiation, removal of theta. So this quantity d2 theta actually has mass dimension 1, or position dimension minus 1. So d2z d2 theta has position dimension 1, length dimension 1. Okay? So we want to write down a dimensionless. Let us suppose that x is going to be like a scalar field. It's going to be dimensionless. Okay. We want to write down a dimensionless action. Then we need an action which is of dimension, mass dimension 1. So your natural instinct, which might have been to put del z of x, can't work because that would have to, two del z of x's would have two higher mass dimension. Okay? So we need to do something more sophisticated. So we wanted to put a, de a derivative that has mass dimension minus half. Luckily, we do have this because this anti-commutes with Q. Because it anti-commutes with Q, uh, d theta x transforms like a superfield because you just take the action out. Okay, so d theta x transforms like a superfield. So product of the d theta x is also transforms like a superfield. So this thing is super symmetric. Okay. So this is the utility of this d derivative that you encounter a lot whenever you're studying super space and super symmetry. Super, uh, super symmetry. It's a derivative that commutes or anti-commutes with the action of super symmetry, and therefore, acting on a super acting on a field with certain transformation properties has the same transformation properties. Okay. So this quantity here is an action that is guaranteed to give us uh, is guaranteed to be super symmetric. It's also conformally invariant. Well, we will see that. We will see that it's also conformally invariant. What? Psi has dimension half. So this is going to be a, a super conformal field theory. Uh, and I, a, a, a theory that has both conformal invariance and super symmetry. Okay. But before continuing with that, let us open this action, uh, open this thing out a little bit and see it in more detail. Okay. Let's take this, which is at the moment quite formal, or quite unfamiliar for many of you, and expand it out. Okay, so we'll just do the d2 theta integral and see what we get. Okay, so it's a bit of a painful exercise, but let's do it. Fine. So, the first thing we need to do is to find what del theta x is. Um, del theta x is the same thing that we got here but with these replaced by pluses because uh, this was q on x and q and del theta differ just by a sign in the uh, right so that is equal to i psi uh, plus theta bar f uh, plus theta del z x um, plus i theta theta bar del z psi bar. Okay. So now we take two of these and we uh, put them together and we want to pull out the terms with 1 theta and 1 theta bar because that's what the integral will, will keep. Okay. So we could have a term which is this with this. So that will give us um, uh, that will give us i 
times i uh, so minus and theta theta bar so um, minus psi del z bar psi bar del z uh, minus psi del z psi bar thank you Mm. I'm sorry. So what we want to do, of course, is to, uh, yeah, is to put one theta bar here. Thank you. <laughs> so let, let's write them. <laughs> yes. So now let's write down del theta bar of x is equal to. Uh, so every psi will be a psi bar. And I'm trying and you help me. Plus theta f uh, plus theta bar del z bar x plus i. And now will this become theta bar theta? Or will it remain theta theta bar? Uh, let's look at that carefully. Uh, let's look at that carefully. This came from, um, it came from theta bar del by del z bar of x. So theta bar del by del z bar of x, so it's theta bar theta. Del, del bar, yes. OK. And now let's work this thing out. Um, so we've got psi with um, this guy with this guy. Yeah. So that is a minus, uh, but plus because theta bar theta. So uh, psi del z psi. Let's make the convention that d2 theta, theta theta bar is 1. OK? Um, yeah. What? Del Z bar. Thank you. Then we have this term with this term, which is plus, minus, minus, minus F square. Uh, is d theta bar of x, or is it a minus sign, a minus sign for theta bar going through theta? Uh, theta bar going through theta. Um, we, give me a term which you're worried about. Uh, that term, this one? Yeah, that term is the last term. OK, let's, you're probably right. Let's, let's look. Thank you. Um, uh, you're probably right. So this term came from d by d theta bar of theta theta bar of f, so you're right. This is uh, minus, thank you. And uh, you say this term? Yes. Let's check that term. Uh, that term I thought we looked at carefully. But let's look at it again. Um, that was theta bar times del by del z bar acting on theta psi. So this is OK. Uh, this is OK. There was no issue here, right? Thank you. OK. So plus f square, thank you. Uh, plus uh, plus x uh, del z bar x. Yes, plus del z x del z bar x. And then this guy with this guy. Uh, so that is minus minus yeah what do we get here here we got theta bar theta 
Ah, but the del z bar comes first. Yeah, sir. Minus del z psi bar psi bar, which is the same as plus after integrating by plus. So which is plus psi bar del z. Oh, you could say it either. <laughs> Both give the same. Yeah, which is the statement. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. This is the full action here. Now, look at the appearance of this f. This f here is just hanging out here. f squared is doing nothing. What do I mean by it's doing nothing? f has no kinetic term and it doesn't couple to anything else. It's just not really a field, right? The equation of motion is going to set it to zero. Okay? It doesn't propagate because there's no kinetic term. It's just not there. So it was a, it's, it's role in life. The role in life of f is some Lagrange multiplier. Um, integrating f out in more interesting actions generates potentials for the field x. Okay, if you had in addition to this kind of structure, if you had added plus v of x, of f of x, then from this, you would have got a term. Um, from this, you could have got a term which, had, uh, which was linear in x. Right? Because if you took this f of x, you would have got a term which was del f by del x. Let's not call it f. Uh, h del h by del x times Taylor expanding so that we keep only the f term. So we keep the theta theta square term times f. Do you see that there's a theta theta bar term of that sort? And then in addition to the f square term, which is just there from the kinetic term, we would have got this f square times f term. Now integrating f out would have created a potential of the form del h by del f, del h, del h by del x, uh, the whole thing square. And by completing the square. Okay, so in, in situations with more interesting actions, this f is an auxiliary field whose integration now generates a potential. Okay? Could be, or could be that the, uh, the potential of this this the super uh, this uh, potential is at zero. I mean, it generates some interesting potential for the theory. This is how this is often uh, such potentials are called f terms, by the way. Okay, to distinguish them from what are called d terms in theories with larger supersymmetry, in when you're dealing with gauge fields, it's another way of generating potentials in gauge in gauge theories. Uh, but it's the route through which supersymmetric actions uh, often generate potentials. But in the particularly simple case we're studying, this is not there. So the potential was just zero. So everything's very boring. Okay? So f is just not there. So you can basically throw it away. Integrate it out, you set it to zero, and this is the theory. Okay? So what is the what, what is the final theory? The final theory is the theory of one free boson interacting with one chiral fermion and one antichiral fermion. Exactly, this thing was exactly the free Dirac field that we started out studying uh, in the previous class. And this is exactly the free bosonics field that we've been studying for most of this course. So you see that the theory of a single free scalar field and a, and a single free Dirac field is supersymmetric. That is it. It's invariant under the supersymmetry transformation. Okay, now I want to continue studying this theory for just five or ten minutes more. Um, before, uh, just, just as a theory by itself, and then we'll turn to more structural aspects. Yes? So what is the motivation of having particular form of Q charge? What is the motivation of having particular form of this Q charge? Yeah. Now, you know. There's, there's a long history to this, which I'll outline to you. Okay. 
the history goes as follows. Okay, the history goes as follows. In the 60s, people started asking the following question. Okay, they started asking the question, you know, could it be that there is a symmetry in the Lagrangian that does not commute with Lorentz generators? Consider a field theory in flat space. Could you imagine, can you imagine that uh, people were studying many theories, let's say, with global symmetries, let's say, fields transforming, however. Okay? Uh, the question people started asking is, could you imagine that you have a theory whose global symmetry algebra does not commute with Lorentz, uh, does not commute with Lorentz generators? Okay. Uh, or has some non-trivial interplay with the Lorentz generator. It's, it's not, not just commute. It's not a direct product between between the Lorentz generators and the global, global symmetry. Coleman and Mandula. Ha. And then Coleman and Mandula are making some assumptions. Proved the following theory. <coughs> they proved that you know, under using a broad set of assumptions, if there was such a symmetry that was not of the direct product form, global symmetry times, uh, uh, times uh, uh, Lorentz generators, then in any such theory, the S matrix would have to be trivial. Okay, this theorem was was taken to say that all symmetry algebras in your theory had to be of this direct product form. Okay, internal space plus uh, internal space times Lorentz. However, you know, as is usually the case in physics, usually the case when we apply mathematics to physics, the mathematics is correct, but it may be physically wrong. Because the, I mean, when you prove a mathematical theorem, you make you make an assumption. You make something goes into that theorem, some assumptions. You have to formulate your physical questions in terms of mathematics. The way Coleman and Mandula formulated their physical questions in terms of mathematics is assuming that your symmetry was had the structure of a Lie algebra. Okay, people were, with slightly more creativity began to ask: Could there be a structure of symmetries that didn't have the structure of a Lie algebra? Okay. And they came up with structures like th of this sort. In fact, all such structures have been completely classified. Okay, so if from one mathematical point of view, you you see that this that this algebra here is not a direct product with the Lorentz algebra. Why? Because we've seen that Q squares to a Lorentz generator. So it's not like this times this. What? It's like a semi it's a semi-direct product. Uh, that, but not even quite, because you see the the um, under the uh, under the rotations, Qs rotate because there's a del Z. In fact, wh what we're going to do is to associate theta. You see, theta is like half of Z, so Z has charge one. Theta will have charge half. So this whole object here, which is del by del theta. Will rotate with charge minus half if Z has charge half, it's charge one. Okay? So it's not even quite a semi direct product because uh, uh, the Qs commute with the rotation generators, but they don't even commute with the, sorry, commute with the translation generators, but they don't even commute with the rotation generators. So it's a more interesting structure. So the mathematical justification is this classification. These supersymmetry algebras have been classified. And uh, we know all that you could aim for. And this is this is one of them. Okay, but uh, once you the the basic point of the classification went as follows: you get more interesting things if you allow bosons to mix with fermions. All right. Now in this space, you know, in this space, what we're doing when you allow bosons to mix with fermions, you want something that will have some non-trivial commutations with non-trivial mixing with the Lorentz, with the Lorentz group. And if you just play around with the components that we have in our hand, if you take one theta and uh, uh, one z, there's not much else you can do. You, you can just try. Okay, so at the moment, we're just starting with something that works without trying to appeal to some broader, deeper theory. Okay, so just take it as something, you know, okay, fine. Um, yeah, okay, let, let's let's go with that. It's also, this, is, this does look like a rotate, rotating boson from the front. 
it does. It does. So x del y minus y del x, but for the unit on the other side, the unit boson number is one. That on the bosonic right, and then the unit term is like a, uh, other number. Yeah, and you see explicitly from here it's rotating boson sphere. The change in x is psi. The change in psi is del x. Change in psi bar. You see, it's doing it. Okay. I won't try to go into more structural justifications. That's okay. Fine. Okay. Uh, it's the q with q bar that is more likely to get the central term. Because central terms are you, you usually, well, if you've got a, well, there may be different kinds of central terms. But if you want a scalar central term, so so by scalar do you mean something that doesn't rotate under Lorentz algebra. Okay. Okay. Then it has to be q with q bar. Then it has to be q. Because q with but q is. Yeah, you could have more. You see, in general, you have all various kinds of central terms. I don't know if you remember, but in Bangalore, we studied the possible central terms. And various dimensions, you can it's different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's that, the kind of analysis we did in Bangalore is what you would have to do. You know, you would have to look at uh, the reality properties you've imposed. You would have to look at the commutation relations and see what can be there. Yeah, yeah. it's quite simple, but it's a bit of algebra. I mean, in this case, it would be with the Q with Q bar. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Excellent. Um, any further questions or comments? Okay. So now let's take this theory and look at its um, look at its uh, look at look at its correlators. Now, the first thing I want to I, I want to note is the following. Um, the first thing I want to note is the following. I want to note that there is an interesting supersymmetric uh, invariant, which is this. Consider Z12 minus, minus theta 1 theta 2. Now, this is an interesting combination of uh, z and thetas for the uh, for the following uh, following reason. Consider the action of q one plus q two on this object z one two minus theta 1 theta 2. Okay, so what am I going to do? What I'm going to try to do is to try to build up the structure of correlation functions, OP and things like that, in superspace. Okay, now you remember that correlation functions uh, in a normal uh, conformal field theory, normal quantum field theory, could only depend on x1 minus x2. Okay, suppose I've got a two-point function for instance. Uh, it can only depend on x1 minus x2. Why is that? It's because you acted with the generator of translations that I had to annihilate the correlator. The generator of translations was del by del x1 plus del by del x2. So that had to uh, annihilate the correlator. And that told you that this thing was a function only of x1 minus x2. Okay. Now, I'm going to be interested in correlation functions in a theory that has, apart from translation values, also has supersymmetry. No, no, not Z1 and Z2. So, oh, sorry, I should pass the clear. Let me let me start. I'm going to be interested in things like this: x of theta one Z1, x of theta two Z2. Suppose I'm interested in a two-point function. Like this. Right, so, 
On your Well sheet? And you're just telling me we have more than one theta theta bar direction. We have multiple theta theta. Yes, because all that theta and theta bar is doing is keeping track of which field you're looking at. Right. So for example, let's say, for example, we have theta 1, theta 2. In this field x, we just have so many more terms. Uh, so if we looked at this thing and we looked at the theta 1, theta 2 term in here, yeah. it would be the term that told you what the correlator of psi at the first place and psi in the second place was. You just expand it out. D2 theta, right, right now my, my algebra of thetas consists of exactly two algebras, right? The theta mm -hmm. and the theta bar. Exactly. It doesn't make sense to say theta at a point that no. has, right? I mean, is it super, super space? I mean, if we have, I mean, it's the correlator of the super field in the super space. Yeah. yeah but and we, we can yeah. just expand it out uh, to uh, find out the correlators for different fields. Exactly. Exactly. Theta should be thought of as a bookkeeping device. So what, what does this mean? It means x plus i theta 1 psi of z1 plus i theta bar 1 psi bar of z1 x of z1 plus theta 1 theta bar 1 f of z1. Not on each, uh, well, uh, of, uh, associated with each field, if right. you want. So in other words, theta 1, theta 2, unified passage. Right? Exactly, exactly, exactly. exactly. Okay. exactly. Okay. That's just what, what I want to make. Yes. yes. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm interested in computing the two-point function of x with x bar, with x with, uh, of x with x. Now I know that things can only depend on z, z1, 2, because del by del z1 plus del by del z2 has to annihilate uh, the correlator. But I know more. I know that q1 plus q2 also has to annihilate the correlator. Okay? So I'm going to try to process that information. Okay? So that information is the del by del theta 1 minus theta 1 del by del z1. Okay? Plus del by del theta 2 minus theta 2 del by del z2 on f of z12, theta1 and theta2 uh, has to be 0, has to, has to vanish. Okay, now one solution of this is suppose f is independent of z12 and depends only on theta1 minus the, uh, theta 1 minus theta 2. Clearly that will do it because then del, because then this is effectively just del by del theta 1 plus del by del theta 2. Okay? So anything that is a, for, a form theta 1 2 is a solution of this equation. Anything that's function just of theta 1 2. But now suppose there's also z 1 2 dependence. Can we find a more interesting solution? Okay? Yes, we, we can and I'm going to show, show you how that goes. So let's just work this out. Let's just act with this thing on. So we have del by del theta 1 of, uh, oh, let me just, I, I, I just give you the answer and then we'll check that it's, that it's the answer. So z12 minus theta 1 theta 2, something that depends on z12 minus theta 1 theta 2 uh, also is invariant under this. So I want to show that, z, that this operator acting on z12 minus theta1 theta2 is 0. I just have one worry. The dimensions, uh, about the dimensions, z has... Z has dimension 1 and theta1 theta2 is a product. So it also has dimension 1. Oh, length dimension 1. Both have length dimension 1. Right? Z12 is linear. Is z1 minus z2. Okay, so let's check this. Let's do del by del theta 1 of this. So we get minus theta 2. Let's do del by del theta 2 of it. We get uh, plus theta 1. Right, because, okay. And let's get, do del by del z1 of it. We get 
minus theta 1 okay and then de do del by del z2 of it we get plus theta 2 what no no a product of two Grassmannian numbers is a product of two Grassmannian numbers. How we can sub you see what is this quantity? If you want to think of this theta, you, you think of it like an operator. Okay, theta you can think of as being let's say uh, um, like a sigma z. You know, it's just it's like an uh, let's say that a space takes all functions are valued inside functions of z times two cross two matrices okay and theta is 0 1 0 0 then theta are like identity cross. what dates are like identity cross variables yeah yeah is it like yeah yeah z will be like identity cross of variables but uh, all i'm saying is that we're adding in this operator space so just this formal addition, it doesn't, yeah, we, we, we even allowed ourselves to add x plus theta times something. It's an enlarged space, we are adding in that higher space. You, all you have to think of is these are formal expressions. In the end, we will only look at correlation functions, for instance, for the components. Okay. I, I'll, I'll tell you that in a moment. That, just, just a bit. Okay. So you see that this, this gives zero. Okay. So in general, supersymmetric combinations, supersymmetric and translationally invariant combinations of coordinates, are either z one two minus theta one theta two, or theta one minus theta two. So correlation functions. Okay. Correlation functions um, will have to be functions of this or this, or, or yes, some some function of these two combinations. Okay. Now, um, go on. If you have a function of x, yes. Then if you translate x by x plus a, yes. X is a coordinate. X is a coordinate. So you have a yes. Of x. Yes. Of x. You exchange x to x plus a. Yes. Change in the fun function is a times del del x of a. Yes. Now, if we write a function which is the function of theta and x. Yes. Theta and x. Yes. Super space. So the super space coordinate. Yes. And then can you do a transformation of the coordinates on a super space? Yes, yes, but, but you know, what we've got is something that mixes up one and two in this one, two way. So it's not like a coordinate by coordinate thing. This, this is a complicated part, yes. Uh, you wanted some, th that's not how that's working. Hmm. If you do a change of coordinates on the super space, hmm. like theta goes to theta, some function of theta and x, hmm. and x goes to some function of theta and x, hmm. that function will change. Can, hmm. we, can we choose this transformation such that that action will become p? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that we can immediately see. You're asking, what? suppose I've got a function of one variable, just theta 1 and z1, okay? And I know that q annihilates it. What is the dependence of that function? What could that function depend on? You are asking, is there any dependence of just one variable such that Q annihilates it? I, I think the answer will be no. No. I mean, it will be purely a function of holomorphic quantities and the anti-holomorphic quantities. And if you want it to be annihilated by both Q and Q bar, there will be nothing. Because this will be the analog of asking, what is what function of one variable is annihilated by del by del z? It's a constant. It will be similar. Change due to action of Q. 
Yes. So in a some particular differential operator. Yes. Can we get the same change by just changing the coordinates on the superspace? Uh, by changing, uh, presumably you can. Let's, so let's see. Let's try. So we want del by del theta plus let's say minus z del by del minus theta del by del z. Okay. Uh, now let's make you want this to be chain rule, right? That's what you're asking for. Okay. Um, so you want this to be some del by del theta tilde. Okay. Uh, so that would have that could work if del uh, theta by del theta tilde was one and uh, del theta by del z uh, del sorry del z by del theta del z by del theta tilde was equal to minus theta okay uh, so you you let's say that your aim was to move to coordinates which were theta tilde and z Okay, um, if your aim was to move to coordinates which were theta tilde and z, then um, uh, then this would be at constant z. Uh, we could solve it, right? We could solve it, but it will not be of relevance to this question because looking for supersymmetrically invariant combinations. This will be like the y variable as you know, right, in, in the study of, there's some solution which we could write on, okay. But uh, uh, that's not of relevance to this, this, this question. This is mixing one. This is mixing one and two. It's more interesting, okay. So now, um, let's keep going. So one more question that we could ask is, what is the equation of motion for? Uh, um, uh, what is the equation of motion for for x? So clearly, the equation of motion is d theta d theta bar of x is equal to zero. And if you open that equation of motion out, I'll leave that as an exercise for you. You will find the equation of motion for the scalar field. That is del z del z bar is equal to zero. And also, you'll find the equation of motions for the fermionic fields. And f is just, of course, f will just be set to 0. You'll find f is equal to 0, the equation of motion for the scalar fields, scalar field, the equation of motion for the fermion fields, and the equation of motion for the fermion bar field. OK? Great. Which also basically tells us that uh, our solutions are, you know, sums of solutions which in which either uh, d theta is equal, equal to 0 or d, d theta bar is equal to 0. Just like when we had an ordinary scalar field, the equation of motion was del z, del z bar is equal to 0, and you got some of analytic, anti-analytic fields. Okay. Uh, so, so let's keep going. Now the question we're going to ask is, what is the two-point function of x with x? Well, we can easily figure it out. Because this two-point function of x with x has to agree when we uh, uh, when we keep just the scalar part with the two-point function of just this uh, this scalar field. Now uh, there's one normalization issue that we should uh, take care of, and that normalization issue goes as follows. I have carefully written down the normalization of the action we're working with. So let me do that. Hmm. Uh, the action we were working with was 1 by 4 pi integral d2 theta d2z uh, d theta x d theta bar x. And when you open that out, you get uh, 1 by 4 pi d2z del z x del z bar x plus all the other stuff, right? Psi del z psi plus psi bar del z bar psi bar. And I won't write the f term because it's just zero. Okay. Now, when we, uh, um, uh, when we worked with our scalar field previously, 
we worked with the action 1 by 4 pi alpha prime d2 theta del zx del sorry, d2 sigma del zx del z bar x okay remember that d2 z is 2 times d2 sigma okay <laughs> so um, our action had um, in okay so this is d2 z by 2 okay so our action had uh, uh, d2 z by 8 pi alpha prime uh, dz x dz by x actually we had d mu d mu is I'm sorry, I'm sorry I may have got the twos upside down we had we certainly had this with a d mu d mu and then if you translate that to dz dz bar uh, I may have got it up upside down uh, 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 just a minute. Dz dz bar. You know, in the z z bar coordinates, the metric was half half, right? So inverse metric is two into one, zero one one zero, and then there are two factors, so there's four times. Uh, I'm sorry. I think we had. 4 times d2 sigma dz dz bar. Does that sound right? Because uh, the inverse metric had, had this, this form and then there are two terms. And then our d2 sigma is d2 z divided by 2. So we had 1 by, 1 by 4 pi times 2 by alpha prime times times this thing so what i'm saying is that uh, in the normalization in which we're working which is convenient because of supersymmetry okay it's it's unnatural from the point of view of supersymmetry to have an alpha prime in the action for x and no alpha prime in the action for psi okay so uh, the change of variables is this is um, 2 by alpha prime by alpha prime square root x old is equal to x new x new is the normalization in which we're working now let me check i've got that right okay pulchis he says x goes to x times square root alpha prime by two which way he hasn't said so <laughs> i assume it's correct okay <laughs> okay uh, great so previously, what did we have? We had x old, x old, two point function was alpha prime by two log of uh, z1 mod z squared. Was this correct? No. Minus. Minus. Okay. So um, because x old is equal to alpha prime by two. That tells us x new, just the scalar component, new, we get rid of the alpha prime by 2, so the minus. Okay? And so it's, of course, now we want some supersymmetric combination that will reduce to this. When we take only the, when we set theta and theta bar to 0. So of course there's an obvious guess, which is minus log of z12 minus theta1 theta2 uh, mod square. Okay, now what does this mean? So we can write this as minus log of z12 minus theta1 theta2 minus log of z12 bar minus theta1 bar theta2 bar. There was a minus Both to start. Yes. Both are minus. Okay? And then we can take each of these two terms and Taylor expand them. 
Now, each of these terms, you only keep the first term in the Taylor expansion because theta 1 squared or theta 1 2 squared is 0. So that is equal to equal to minus log of z12. Now, let's keep our wits about us. Minus, minus, so that cancels. So plus 1 by, plus theta 1, theta 2 by z12. And similarly on the bar side, I'm not writing the bar. Okay? But what does this mean? What, so what does this theta 1, theta 2 mean? What it meant was, uh, what we got when we looked at the definition, x was equal to uh, x, exactly, x plus, This is now the superfield. Okay. So we here it was just the boson part. So okay, so what we're saying is that when x the superfield, suppose we set all the things equal to zero, we should get back what would be x the boson. Field. Exactly. And that's what we're trying. Okay. Right? And it has to be supersymmetric. Yeah. Now we know the only way to supersymmetric z12 is z12 minus theta one theta two. So that's all I did. Yes. What? We could have had a function of theta 1 plus theta 2 added to this. Minus what? Theta 1 minus theta 2. We could have had a function of theta 1 minus theta 2 added to this, in which case we would not have seen it directly from the, um, uh, from the, uh, uh, from the bosonic result. This I agree with. But I'm just going to check whether this by itself works. Actually, there's a better argument, which is to use the equation of motion. Uh, I'll give you that argument in a moment. But uh, first, let's just check that it works. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. F uh, first, let's just check that this guy works. Okay. So, uh, uh, this guy now, what does it mean? Let's remember that x was equal to x. Um, plus i theta psi. No, all the anti-holomorphic parts we don't need for this argument. Okay, so when we take x, x with x, and we look at the term that's theta one theta two, what we're getting is minus psi of z one psi of z two. Excellent. Plus theta 1, theta 2. Absolutely. Because the other theta 2 travels to psi of z1. Absolutely right. Q on the. What? Q on the to, get the, to get the whole thing? Yeah, we, we, we could. Um, but uh, Yeah, yeah. Let, let me check this works before you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we get psi, uh, theta one, theta two, psi of z one, psi of z two, and we what we've got here, this is equal to theta one, theta two, by z one two. That's a plus, not a minus, because each of these anti-commuting fields. So theta psi is equal to minus psi theta. Okay. So what we had was theta psi, theta psi. Even at what? Even at, Even at different points. All the all anti-commuting fields right. anti-commute with all all others. All the sides commute with all the sides that are anti-commute. Anti-commute with all the sides. Anti-commute, right? And all the sides anti-commute with all the thetas. Every anti-commuting variable okay. anti-commutes with everything else. Even though the theta one and theta two are just just uh, are anti anti-commute. Even at different points. At different points, they all anti-commute with each other. All of them are anti-commuting variables. Yeah, you should, you know, if you wanted to build an operator algebra that would do this, well, you would have to do the kind of thing you do for Clifford algebras. Mm -hmm. You know, it would be like a product space. Right. So, 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 well, like sigma 2, sigma 2, sigma 1. Oh, yes, of course. That kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, right. and so, so anti-commute. Anti it's like Clifford algebra. Yeah. Thanks. <coughs> 
Okay. So, uh, so, so this tells us that psi of z1, psi of z2 uh, is equal to is equal to one by z1. Okay, we know this is correct. So that uh, that uh, that, uh, that 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 that's a check that it worked. Now uh, Indranil wants to suggest that the way to get it is <coughs> as follows. <coughs> Hmm. You know, you're going to have to act twice. Yes. Uh, With two you have yeah. Uh, twice. You act twice, and maybe that's okay. Uh, uh, it will mix. You probably will get it. Okay, we can try. Let's try. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, suppose you had, suppose you had, and uh, no, I don't think that it's automatic. Yeah, it's okay, good question. So suppose my answer was f of z1, 2 minus theta 1, theta 2, uh, comma, some other function, plus, plus theta 1 minus theta 2 times g of z1, 2 minus theta 1, theta 2. The bosonic, this will be supersymmetric. But the bosonic answer will never see this g. Because, zero. because this part's always zero when we set the theta to zero. Yeah, so I don't think that the bosonic part in principle completely determines it. No, no, this, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's just algebra dependent in, in this situation. Uh, well, 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 here we know that, let's say that we have, we're in a situation where f is zero. All correlation functions of f are zero. Okay, still, this would be supersymmetric. And it will be f zero? What? I think the correlator of f will be zero. Um, because you see, we're doing everything completely analytic. And F is something that mixes analytic and anti -analytic. Theta, theta, buff. Theta, theta, buff, yes. Oh, okay. hmm. So I think this is totally fine. Still it doesn't give it. still doesn't give it, yes. Yeah. OK, yeah. Um, here, you see, of course, here you could get, get this from the following uh, way of thinking. Um, we know that it's like this, right? Why did we know that del z, the del z of x was a function of only z's? It's because we knew the del z bar of del z x was equal to zero. Yes. That was the equation of motion. Okay. So here we know that the equation of motion tells us the del theta, uh, del theta bar del theta of x is equal to zero. Okay, so it's got to be a function of things so that it obeys this equation of motion. Now we can, this would completely fix it. This will completely fix it. You know, when you act, so that will rule out your theta 1 minus theta 2 dependence. Uh, this will give you some non trivial theta 1 minus theta 2 dependence. But this would basically completely fix it. You can check that this obeys the equation of motion. Okay, okay excellent. So, we understand what the OP of the x's is in superspace. It's this log with just z12 replaced by z12 minus theta1, theta1, theta2. Okay, excellent. Now, uh, so, so that's great. Now we want to move further. Now, maybe I'm going to tell you two minutes how, how we're going to use this. Uh, we started saying this in the last class, but uh, I'll say it again. In order to make string theory, what we did was to start with a conformal field theory. We had this conformal field theory coupled to, super, uh, coupled to gravity on the world sheet. Okay? And we gauged 
we gauged the uh, diffeomorphisms as well as the Weyl symmetry. Okay, by working in this conformal gauge, where we set the uh, metric to be something specific. Okay, we we then worked in this conformal gauge, and we had the structure of a conformal field theory on the uh, on the Weyl sheet in that fixed background metric, and then the eventual story with the BRST symmetry told us that we had to effectively gauge conformal invariants. In physical states were only primaries, all descendants were, were to be thrown away. Okay. So, now what we are going to do, you know the way that a systematic way of building up the super, the, of building up the super string is to do the same thing starting with super gravity coupled with a super conformal field theory. A super gravity coupled with some super matter. Now that systematic way would then go do the analog of gauge fixing, going to some, um, going to a particular metric and a particular uh, Fermi on analog of the metric, and what we will get in the end is a superconformal field theory, like the one we have. Okay. okay, what we will get in the end is a superconformal field theory, in which the whole superconformal invariance is gauged. That is that the BRST symmetry will tell us that we will deal with pri only primary operators under this whole superconformal invariance. Okay? So in order to begin to start understand the, uh, and understanding this, we want to start understanding the structure of superconformal transformations. What does the superconformal algebra look like? Sorry. Hello? Ha, man. Either sounds lovely, mummy. Whichever. <laughs> Ethiopian if I have a choice. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Okay. So what we're gonna do is to try to start generalizing the structure that we had for super uh, for conformal field theories. Now the star player when we were studying conformal field theories was the stress tensor. <laughs> Okay, and I'll remind you that Tz1, Tz2 had the uh, OP structure 3 by 2, Z1, 2 to the power 4 plus T of Z2, Z1, 2 squared plus del T, Z1, 2. Okay, this is the structure we want to generalize. First, we want to understand. What is going to be the analog of P? Okay, and next we want to understand what is going to be the analog of the structure. Okay, so why was T important to us? T was important to us in string theory because it coupled to the metric. Right, I mean the, the equation of motion corresponding to the field whose gauge we fixed. Namely, t equals 0 had to be imposed. That, that was its importance in string theory. Okay? Now, the corresponding partner to the metric, the fermionic partner to the metric, is a spin 3 halves field. Right? This is a Raita Schwinger type of field. As some of you, anyone who's looked at supergravity knows. Right. So, the fermionic current corresponding to that will be a spin 3 half current. So let's call that fermionic current, we'll call this guy Tb. Let's call that fermionic current Ts. So we want to make an algebra with a guy which is spin 3 halves and a guy that is spin 2. Uh, we've learned that it's useful to work in superspace. How do we combine them together? Well, there's a natural thing to do. Consider T, which is equal to Tf plus theta times Tb. Okay, this is a spin 3 half or a dimension 3 half. Um, uh, dimension 3 half super field. Because, you know, this, this carries position to the power half. Okay, so this is the natural super field to work with. 
So let's call this whole thing t. And we're going to try to write down what we can for the, uh, for the structure of the correlation functions of this superfield t. OK? So let's see. Let's see what we. What? It is constant, some, some amount of constant. This, this expression for t. Some amount of constant is used. There is no, no, no uh, auxiliary field. There's no auxiliary field? Yes, yes, yes. Some amount of supervariate stuff is fixed. Yeah. Uh, all we're going to do, you know, we've got the fermionic, we've got the fermionic, we've got the fermionic field, we've got the bosonic field, we want to write down the correlation functions of them together. That's all we're trying to do. No, no, and there's no theta bar. This is purely analytic. This multiple will not have anything else. Speak, I, the super gravity form may have some auxiliary field. You integrate that out. So the auxiliary fields will be there, right? Where, where auxiliary fields will be there, they'll, they'll be like the F. They'll do nothing. OK? okay? Not yeah. Good. And the, the real fields that will play any real role this will be G and the spin 3 half field. And the, the, these will be their partners. OK. It's some spin 3 half field, something called the Rita Schwinger field. OK. Um, you know, this is true in every dimension. If you look at supergravity, if you look at supergravity actions in four dimensions or in ten dimensions, the minimal multiplet will have, sorry, will have a spin two field as well as a spin three halves field. May have more. Does it play a role similar to the metric? Does it? It's the fermionic, it's, you know, when you act with supersymmetry um, on, um, on the spin three halves field, you'll get the metric and vice versa. It's the supersymmetric partner of the metric. Okay. It's like the gauge you know, you know, just like a, a, a gauge boson always comes with a spin half super partner. In the same way, the, sp the spin two with the spin three halves. Because, because supersymmetry carries spin half, it has to either increase or decrease spin by half. And I'd better decrease spin by half because, you know, spin three half, five halves fields are totally uncontrolled. Right? It always works this way. Yeah, you know, people try to give all kinds of geometrical interpretations to these things, which get increasingly forced. Okay. You know, you can play that game. <laughs> It depends on dimension. So okay. In four dimensions, the minimal number of supersymmetries is four. Okay. Uh, in two dimensions, it's two. That's the one we're dealing with. In in ten dimensions, the minimal number of supersymmetries uh, possible is sixteen. Eleven dimensions, thirty-two. You know, so yeah. So uh, the eight is in four dimensions, right? The maximum supersymmetry is uh, no possible. eight times four. Oh yeah. Eight of the minimum. Okay. Yeah, when you when people say n equals eight, they mean yes. eight times the minimum. The ah, minimum is ah, four. The, the invariant statement is that the largest number of supersymmetries you can have is thirty-two. Do you want to see why that's the case? Let's let's quickly see it. <laughs> okay. You see, when you look at short multiples of supersymmetry, as anyone who is in Bangalore knows very well, uh, the way you make representations of supersymmetry is that half of the supersymmetries act as zero in the representation. The other half act like a Clifford algebra. Okay? So suppose you have 32 supercharges, 16 of them act like zero in these massless multiples. Okay? The other 16 act like Clifford algebra. Okay. So if six, you have 16 guys acting like Clifford algebra, then uh, they go to minus 2 to plus 2, that argument, right? That's that argument. <laughs> exactly. 
So if you have 16 guys acting as a, as a Clifford algebra, now Clifford algebra is what? You can, make a, you can think of a Clifford algebra as fermionic oscillators with raising and lowering. Okay, so that means you've got eight fermionic oscillators because they pair up into raising and lowering. This gamma Z, gamma Z bar. <coughs> okay, now what is the Hilbert space that you create with these, th these, uh, these oscillators? The bottom of your Hilbert space is that which is, you know, the state that is destroyed by all destruction fermionic oscillators. But now there are eight creation harmonic oscillators, each of which raises spin by half. So, the top of your multiplet is going from the bottom with eight raising operators. So, the difference in spin between the top and the bottom That's the maximal, uh, is, is 4, which means the difference in spin between the top and the bottom here uh, is 4 and therefore it, it's times half. Uh, 4, which could be minus, you could have the bottom being spin minus 2 and the top being spin plus 2. That's how it must work. Okay. So the minimal representations of supersymmetry will have fields of spin 2. Suppose you had 34 superchargers, oh, 30, let's say 36 superchargers, okay? Then this 8 becomes 9. Then the difference in spins, okay, would have to be uh, 9. So you would have to have 5 half spin particles. And we just haven't ever, nobody's ever understood how to make sense of interacting field theories with spins, mass, interacting massless field theories with spins greater than 2. That's basically where this 32 comes from. You know, the supersymmetry algebra exists for all n. It's just we've never understood how to make, it won't be a theory of gravity, it would be a theory that may have gravitons but will also have higher spin massless fields and nobody's ever managed to make sense of this. Is there some theoretical inconsistency in making some? Even at the classical level, even at the classical level in flat space, nobody's ever managed to make an action that is classically consistent for such things. You know, by classically consistent, I mean classically consistent along with the fact that the only states in the theory should be, I mean, it should be a classical theory such that when quantized, we'll have only positive norm states. So you have to remove those you know, the apparently negative norm states. So you need some equation of motion that includes the gauge invariance that will remove the negative norm states. Even at the classical level in flat space, nobody's ever managed to make sense of these things. Just as a classical question, to write down a classical interacting action for such theories, nobody's ever managed it. You know, there's an interesting sub subtext to that. In ADS space, the same question was posed. There, there are all kinds of no-go theorems in flat space. The, this question was posed in ADS space and tackled intensively by this guy named Vasiliev um, in the 1980s and 1990s. And he came up with this incredible consistent classical set of equations describing higher spin theories in ADS space. But you know, for consistency it had to happen that he couldn't put just a spin. If he had a spin larger than two, then he had to have all spins. And the gauge invariance was one that mixed all of the spins together. This is an inc incredible intricate structure that made sense in ADS space, but as far as anyone, anyone can tell, doesn't make sense in flat space. And uh, you know, this higher spin theory has found a role in ADS CFT because it's the dual to free theories. Free vector theories have an ADS CFT dual in terms of Vasily effect. So even that structure, that structure that exists, exists in a very tight way. And, okay, there's a long story which we, we won't go into. Uh, it sounds very likely that this is not just some technique, it's not just lack of imagination, there's something quite deep going on here. I'm not saying that nobody will ever make sense of interacting massless high spin fields, but it won't be easy. There'll be some intricate structure, some in interesting story. Okay, yeah. Uh, forgetting about quantum mechanics. I'm saying even on the classical level, it's just a very hard problem. Yeah. Just to be clear, when we're saying super, by super gravity, is this synonymous with having a local super Poincaré invariant? Yes. Okay, so when we're, so on the world sheet, that we have our nuts on, and then, so where is the super gravity that we're going to want to go on the world sheet? So we want to upgrade the diffeomorphism invariant that we have on the world sheet. 
Exactly. 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 So the diffeomorphism invariance came with the graviton as its partner. The local supersymmetry will come with the graviton and a spin three half field as its partner. Okay? And the, the equation of motion for that spin three half field will be that Tf is equal to zero. Just like the equation of motion for the graviton field was that Tb was equal to zero. Would you say that Vr is just a higher form, higher form symmetry? Is there a BRST for higher form gate symmetries? Now, higher form gate symmetries, well, presumably you could make one. But you know, it's a bit trivial because you know nobody ever makes them non abelian. Yeah, so in the abelian case, the whole BRST story is a bit trivial, right? Because the ghosts. But you just said that even with higher spin symmetries, basically sort of like maybe a higher form symmetry. No, no, no. By higher spin, I mean more than spin 2. Higher form never has more than spin 1. More than spin 1, never has. The anti symmetric ones will never have. Those. Anti symmetric ones have no problems. No problem. By, by higher spin, I mean in any given two plane, more than two. spin more than two. That is where the trouble arises. Whole string theory will never get a spectrum. A x, you will never get anything other than this totally anti symmetric things. You, you will not get anything that has more than two boxes if you look at from one plane. In the massless, in the massless sector. Never, never. We've never seen anything like that. The, the, the you only to reverse the argument. If you have seen that, then reverse the argument. It, the only way we, such things um, have arisen at all, I mean, can in, one way in which such things might arise is if you take a massless, a tensionless limit of string theory. Now, if that makes sense, then all the states of string theory become massless. <laughs> this sounds like a very singular limit. I, the, the, okay, there's no clean way in which. Now, even if it, ha it does happen, it'll happen like in Vasiliev theory. You won't be able to get one massless guy. They'll all become massless together. Hmm. Okay, let's keep going. We're, I, we should s soon stop. Uh, the disadvantage of starting on the afternoon is that there's temptation to go on. <laughs> but we'll just be disciplined. <laughs> okay, uh, but but le let's let's. Uh, uh, okay. Um, so uh, l let me just start setting this up, and then I'll I'll ask you to try to try to play around, and then we'll finish this this, this next class. So the thing that we want to do is we've got tf z one theta one, tf of z two theta two, and we want to find the, all the singular terms in the OP. You got not tf just t right? Obviously. Yeah, t. Sorry. Thank you. The full superfield. Okay, now this quantity here is of dimension 3. I mean, this is 3 halves, this is 3 halves, so the product is dimension 3. Okay, so the most singular term is something of uh, 1 over uh, z12 cube, but this has to be supersymmetric. So, so it sounds reasonable that you could have a 1 over z12 minus theta 1 theta 2. The whole thing cube. This one could have. Okay. What else can one have? Well. You can have theta one two added with t. Okay, so let's try. So we could have theta one two times t. So that's dimension two. And sorry, that's dimension. Three by two. Uh, that's the minus yeah, that's dimension one. Yes. Uh, and we could have one of z one two minus theta one theta two, the whole thing cube. Uh, square. The whole thing square. Or you know, in uh, uh, in the in the previous story. Exactly. We could we could try to have uh, we we might be able to have things like 
d theta t. Now, d theta t, this lowers the dimension by, this is, the whole thing is dimension 2. So, this could have a z 1, 2, the whole thing, z 1, 2 minus theta 1, theta 2 to the power 1. Okay. And what else? Uh, well, just just from the point point of view of dimension, let's write out everything we could have had. Um, sorry, we, we could also sorry, say again. One over theta. No, one over theta one two is not a good thing. It's a very singular thing. Oh, theta should always come as Taylor expansion. You know, 1 over theta doesn't make sense. So theta should be thought of as entail. So everything should be polynomials in theta. Okay. Uh, we could have theta 1 minus theta 2. So theta 1, 2 times del z t. Times del z t divided by z 1, 2 minus uh, theta 1, Theta two to the power one. Theta one two by itself is not supposed to be supersymmetric in neither del z. So the combination will be supersymmetric. No, no. Theta one two is supersymmetrically in that. It was one of those combinations. And del z is also supersymmetric in that. I I didn't emphasize this, but let's check. It was del by del theta minus theta del by del z. This commutes with del by del z, obviously, because there's no z. Okay, so del by del theta was a supersymmetric derivative, that was hard, but just the ordinary del by del z is also supersymmetric. We didn't use it in our Lagrangian because it had too high dimension, not because it wasn't, uh, not because it wasn't supersymmetric. Okay, so uh, can anyone think of anything else that could appear? Uh, can we use z12 on top? Now, if you use z12 on top, we can't use that because we have to be the supersymmetric combination. You could use the whole thing on top, but that's just lowering this power. Yeah. Everything is a function of theta12 and z12. And the simplicity is that theta12 can only appear linearly. You can't square theta12. So basically, what we have, a more systematic way of doing it would be to say that. Um, um, We've got either one times something, so t t. There's the theta one two part, and there's the non theta one two part. Okay, so three. T, so these two terms were from the non theta one two part. Okay, since the whole thing was dimension three. Since the whole thing was dimension three, uh, there was this guy, or there was this guy, and basically that's it. I think. Um, Basically, that's it, I think. There's nothing else we can write without the theta 1, 2. Okay. And then the theta 1, 2 parts are this guy and this guy. Okay. Now, in the next class, we will try the kind of systematic analysis we did last time, did at the beginning of the course, um, in which we logically argued what terms could appear. Uh, and when we get tired of doing that, we'll appeal to <laughs> <laughs> matching with, this, with the parts that we know, namely the bosonic part, and we fix all these coefficients in there. We're getting one extra coefficient now. We get. You can scale in some way to fix one of the coefficients to one. Let's use the d theta t to one. d theta t to one, yeah, exactly. Then d theta. Th um, now. Ever we had two, right? Well. Uh, I, I didn't understand. Say again. Sir, in the in the Poissonian stress tensor OP, yes. you could have written first one is C by 2, second one is H times T, mm -hmm. third one is some something, K times del T. Yes. Then you scale K, T such that you set K to be 1. Correct. Then you have two independent parameters. Correct, correct, correct. Here you try to do the same thing. 
Correct. So we will once again choose matching with something. So if each one of the quotes is into one. For instance, we will demand that the uh, term that is just Z12. Yeah, so if each one of them. Yeah. And then everything else will be. But then see, one extra compared to above. Oh, well, yeah. One extra compared to above, we, ha we haven't yet done all our logic, right? We haven't checked whether all these things are consistent. Okay. We'll get it all there. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, we've just done dimensional analysis. Yes, now you will probably look for conservation and so on and then you use something. We'll look at, uh, yeah, I, I don't even know what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm sure I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be like one, two symmetry, you know, those kind of things. Yeah, we use that a lot when we did the T thing. We'll play the same game. I'm sure we'll get it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. But these are the terms that could appear. And now this is the space in which to play. And we'll play. And we'll get it. Okay. But we'll do that next time.